Please welcome ma'am and complete your presentation. Thank you, Dr. Raju and uh, Surya and Dr. Banu for all the uh, support in getting to this point uh, to Kale University. I appreciate the invitation to the Intelligent and Smart Computing Conference. Uh, to begin with, uh, just to mention, ladies and gentlemen, I'm currently in Australia. Uh, I do work for Arizona State University, uh, but given COVID, I've been thrust back to Australia. Uh, and so today I have present, prepared for you uh, a presentation, a full length presentation, uh, which looks at uh, the black box within. Okay, so I really want you to think social implications in this talk because uh, I'm a member of the IEEE uh, Society on the Social Implications of Technology. I'm also a member of uh, the IEEE uh, Consumer Technology Society, recently changed its name. I'm a board member of the Council of RFID. I'm a member of the IEEE Brain Project and Standards Project in leading uh, as a working group chair for P2089. And of course, uh, my beloved Arizona State University, where I direct the group Society Policy and Engineering Collective. I'm in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, which is very much a new school, about five years old, and I'm a joint hire as a tenured professor with the School of Computing, Informatics and Decision Systems Engineering. And given these two areas coming together, I would say I'm fairly transdisciplinary. Uh, we've been seeing over time IEEE has begun to request these global challenges require global solutions that are in fact transdisciplinary. And so today I'll be jumping between disciplines and I'll be doing that unashamedly. Uh, so sit back, relax, and I hope to take you on a tour of the black box within. As a highlight in the context of this talk, uh, I wanted just to say a few words. I began my full-time work as a network engineer. That's what it said on my employment offer letter, graduate engineer, and that was around 1996. I began my PhD the following year in 1997, two years before uh, the term Internet of Things had been coined by Kevin Ashton in 1999. And I say this because it was from the outset that I felt that things would be tagged. It wouldn't just be barcodes, it would be smart devices that would basically follow us around. And it was the concept of the follow me uh, number which emerged around 1998 through the uh, ITU, which I was studying heavily with my colleagues uh, in Wollongong, Australia uh, at Norton Networks. The follow me number, what did that mean? And what if there was a follow me tag? And what if you could remotely uh, request a transaction, a get request from a tag that was somewhere out in the field? By 1998, uh, the company I worked for, Norton Networks, which was in 150 countries at the time uh, before it went bankrupt in 2005, they sponsored a project called Cyborg 1.0. And Cyborg 1.0 was literally taking a transponder implant the size of a grain of rice and putting it in the left arm uh, of Professor Kevin Warwick. And that $200,000 project sponsored uh, uh, Dr. Mark Gasson and actually went through the potentiality of a professor holding a smart tag inside his body for a period of 10 days. Of course, that was followed up in the 2000s, early 2000s by Cyborg 2.0, where uh, Kevin Warwick and wife Irina were actually communicating through uh, what they call Morse code in these implantable chips that were embedded in their body. In 2002, I finished my work in pre-sales engineering. Uh, I had had great exposure uh, throughout uh, Asia, but also North America. And I became a member of the IEEE SSIT community in 2004, a couple of years after I began my formal academic work at the University of Wollongong. I was an integral member of the Research Network for a Secure Australia between 2005 and 2013, and later a Centre of Excellence on Policing and Security. I also completed law studies in transnational crime in 2010. And this is just an overview to give you a context of the backgrounds and backdrops uh, that I'll be thrusting upon you in the next 40 minutes or so before question time. So the outline, literally, we're going to do four things today. We're going to understand what are black boxes and what is Katina talking about when she's referring to the black box within. 
within what? The human being, perhaps. We're going to discuss operational scenarios as were described and defined by NIST. We're going to talk about uber surveillance and the antecedents of this novel concept and social implications. What do we mean about the black box within? What could be some of those unanticipated consequences as well as anticipated and unintended and intended consequences? So let's begin this first segment looking at open systems theory. What is the black box? Traditionally, what have we understood when we look at open systems as opposed to closed systems? We have an input. Of course, there is some processing in the middle and there is an output. And then we have this dotted line boundary with the surroundings, the external environment. Well, the black box is that which sits within. What happens there? What are the interactions that take place? And we could have simplified closed systems, very complex open systems. And as we see, the world is increasingly becoming complex because of the transactions and their meshed, meshed nature. We no longer rely on the knowledge that it's one single organization that creates the actual footprint of digital data. In fact, there could be subsidiaries involved, there could be uh, partnerships, alliances, and all of these different business models by which something happens in the open system. So input, processing, output. And that thing in the middle, that open system, is what is traditionally called the black box. When we speculate, if there can be interventions to a black box and what that might mean, sometimes we call these experiments. There's an input, there's a process, the black box, and there's an output. But if there is an observer, perhaps an agent looking in, we could be running an experiment. But in which fields are we talking about? When we talk about black boxes in software programming, what does that mean? Ah, the AI is doing something perhaps, or this object-oriented program is doing something we don't quite understand because it's calling on libraries from all of these different places. In physics, it's actually a black box artifact. It's something that is physical in nature. In cryptography, we talk about the black box encryption algorithm that nobody is supposed to know about. In testing, of course, we see these experiments and black box kinds of testing, mathematical mod modeling where there are limited cases, and of course, this great notion of artificial intelligence. Well, what is the AI program doing? Well, who knows these days? It depends. Uh, and on whose data has it been trained on? Oh, well, this set of data, but is it biased or unbiased? And so with this recently, uh, my colleagues and I at the Transactions on Technology Society, that's Roba Abbas, uh, George Rissos, Sabio Skornavacha and Samuel Fosso Womba, we looked into the design of autonomous systems and their applications. And what is so different? How do we imbue ethics in AI when we are not actually knowing exactly what's happening in the creation of the AI or the autonomous system and how it acts? Think about human in the loop, human out of the loop. Think about the algorithmic mystery that comes with a black box, a product, and perhaps Corporate environments protect this through a patent. They say, this is my, perhaps, KFC secret sauce. This is my uh, formula to Coca-Cola. But in actual fact, they're talking about a product that's electronic. And that company code is what they're trying to protect through the patent or the algorithm. And so that's an algorithmic mystery. In the second type of black box, what we see is uh, a concept defined by M.G. Michael back in 2006. It's an embedded surveillance device. It's technologies that are embedded that we cannot see in all sorts of different devices. And in particular, the notion of uber valence pertains to the human being. So I want you to think about uh, a flight data recorder that is in aeroplanes versus that which is an embedded microchip implant that's tethered inside the human being. So imagine this aeroplane that has a black box recorder in case it goes down and something goes wrong. And so the observers and those investigators after a crash, they recover the black box so they can hear what is happening at the cockpit and the conversation between the pilots, but they can also look at other information about altitude, speed, and all of these sorts of parameters that are relevant to a crash investigation, an accident. So imagine if each one of us carried one of these microchip implants in the human body that was either medical or non-medical, and that that implant could be tethered 
to a device like a smartphone or a tablet or a dashboard somewhere remotely. Imagine the visual data uh, recorder could be worn or lugged around. Perhaps I would put it on my belt buckle or in my back pocket or is perhaps the mobile phone a type of black box. But here, when we're talking about the black box within, we are talking about ubervalence. We are talking about embedded surveillance devices like those carried by heart pacemaker recipients that monitor what is happening in the body, such as those who are holding glucose monitors uh, if they have diabetes type 1, for instance. And so I want to paint this picture and embed this picture in your mind. What we're talking about today is data analytics from within the human body that tells us not only who it is, where it is, or what condition the individual is in, perhaps by monitoring vital signs and characteristics, your heart rate, your pulse rate, whether you're sweating, whether you're stressed, all of these other things, whether your body uh, has had a temperature elevation beyond that 36.7 Celsius. So this is akin to having this red box, this flight recorder in the human body. And many people are posing that this is our future. So identity, location, and condition. And that denotes the prevalence. So let me take you again. We're here in the sky. We're in an airplane. The airplane has a black box recorder. It's recording everything. We start to get through the mist. We get down to at a lower altitude, and then we can see more. We are seeing more in terms of visual analytics. We can now see paddocks, we can see houses, we can see farmhouses and other things like silos. We can see divisions of land use. We can see mountainous areas and terrains. We have better visibility by watching. This is actually, ladies and gentlemen, data. It's geographic data, data that we've seen through satellites. We also have orthographic photography that takes photos over a landscape, a terrain. And so as we're getting closer and closer to landing, we're seeing more and more of the landscape. This is exactly what this conference is about, intelligence and smart computing, smart devices and data analytics. And as we get lower, the resolution is greater, okay? And we are able to understand the surroundings uh, and do calculations. Perhaps I wanna know uh, what kind of pest control I could place over this area that we see here, if there is enough water in the dam, if I need to increase. But now we have sensors that are sprawled all over the place, environmental sensors that can tell us this information. We not only have the photographs from the satellites or the airplanes, we now also have ground sensing devices that tell us about the environment around us. And so we can see cars now, we're on the street level view, and we can see the surrounds around us like the air traffic control tower, and now we're at street view, okay? We've left the aerial view, we are at street view. And so we take this paradigm of a black box recorder, as is denoted in this presentation, like the flight deck recorder, and we can see a black box car insurance offering here. What does that mean, a black box car insurance? So we not only have them in the planes, but we also have them in the vehicles. This is a device that is able to tell a parent where their child is and also to lower the car insurance premium that they are paying. I can use my device to toggle remotely on the surroundings of that vehicle and make sure my son or daughter is not speeding, is not cutting corners too quickly, is not uh, breaking too hard at the lights and causing uh, trauma behind them. Uh, but you can call this telematics. It could be perhaps what we're talking about, telematics of the human body. So imagine the globe, but instead of the globe, you are the globe. Your body is the entity that we are investigating. Katina's heart rate, Katina's pulse rate, Katina's temperature levels, Katina's stress levels. And so we've gone from the flight deck recorder in the aeroplane to that in the car. And what about in the house? I think perhaps we have all invested in uh, hub devices that can now let us control. Your home is an ecosystem, in fact. It's a closed campus system, but we are now using this device to tether to our hub to basically change settings on temperature, okay? Air conditioning, change the lighting, perhaps make it dimmer, 
uh, as the evening wears on and we can save energy. Uh, perhaps we want to have music play as we enter a particular walkway uh, or having a shower or whatever. It's all customizable. So from the aeroplane to the car, to the home, to the human being. Ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about the last mile traditionally in networks, we've always talked about the end user. Basically, we're talking about how do we have broadband uh, coverage in most areas, and then that last mile, which is to the user, the tail to the home. If there is no fiber to the curb or fiber to the home, how do we do that wirelessly? And increasingly, we are coming out with different solutions like 5G, not just 4G. And so now what we have for the first time in human history is the capability to actually wear sensors on our bodies. We not only have to wear them or can wear them, we can tether to the devices that we carry and lug around. So my wearable can talk to my uh, 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 mobile phone. For example, maybe I have an Apple Watch that is communicating with the Apple phone. But we're also talking about what could this body area network? It's not just a metropolitan area network or a regional area network or a wide area network or a local area network in a building. We're now talking body area networks and where there is data to be, to be taken, it will be. Okay, and so the question then becomes, who owns this data that is being collected around the body through wearable devices and implantable devices? And if we have a heart pacemaker, an Apple phone, if we have uh, uh, an Apple wristwatch, if we have a glucose monitor, if we have another wearable device, like a headset that never comes off our body, perhaps we have additional things. Uh, COVID safe apps, for example, as technological responses to the reduction of the transmission of COVID. Whatever it is, we are now starting to talk about the emergence and the requirement of what's called a gateway. It's like the hub, not in the house, right? So you have your Google Nest, for instance, it's a hub that is on your body. And maybe that is somewhere around here, the gateway there near the belly button. The access point is several meters away at most to anything. So because we're talking about uh, near field communication, most likely, or Bluetooth enabled low energy, or we're talking about other devices that require to be triggered by power because their power source perhaps is dormant for the greater part. What we need to think about is that these are the kinds of applications we are talking about when we're talking about body area networks. They are tethered within distance, within near field, within radio frequency field, within Bluetooth range, which could be between two and 10 meters at best. And so what happens when we start to look at applications that gather data from wearable devices or implantables? We start thinking about things that could be to the nearest. Okay, what do we frequent? entry and exit gantry points but what does that mean in reality and we're talking about electric fields electric currents electromagnetic communication technology basically wireless devices not something you have to plug into somewhere using a usb stick for example or something like that and so uh, a, a famous uh, business researcher from new york university i believe his name is holloway uh talks about this requirement to almost circumvent the capability of someone to retain their own data. You know, he used this beautiful depiction here. Sorry, it's Galloway, not Holloway. Scott Galloway, the four what to do. So he talks about uh, Google, Facebook, Amazon, and Apple. And he says they're almost empowered to own different parts of the body at the moment. Google has the search engine brain, uh, Facebook, the heart, because that's where we have our connections and social media and relationships. Amazon, the gut, the gut in, in the sense that if we want to buy something, the wants, the desires, the needs, we can just go to Amazon Prime and buy to our heart's content. And Apple, of course, uh, dubiously there uh, depicted. So what we have here is basically an end-to-end -end ownership of data when you think about it, the mind, the heart, the gut, and so forth. And this is how data is actually emanating out of the individual. And when we start to study data analytics, what you are probably going to be thinking about is what happens when we collect information on fault tolerance from heart pacemakers. Of course, we are aware of the major 
uh, row and debate going on about who owns heart pacemaker data. Is it companies uh, like Medtronic or is it everyday patients who actually consent to getting one of these pacemakers put in their body? That's the question today that we have. And so the truth is the patient does not own this information. It's actually the provider of the device that owns it. And so here we see another example of an implantable device that was demonstrated by the company Autodesk Research in 2012. This particular device, uh, you can see here carved out on the forearm of this man, had a tap sensor, a tactile button, and a pressure sensor in order to allow for almost two-way communications. I would type as I requested a particular service of the implantable. This was just one device. And so in our work with uh, MG Michael and Dr. Roba Abbas, what we have seen is this constancy towards miniaturization, this constancy towards knowing the last mile, that we need better visibility, better data, more data, and we have to do more effective things with the information. So we've gone from the satellite view, the street view, to the person view, to now what we're calling the sensor view. And perhaps we are now talking about implantables for the mass market. I, I want to make it clear here that I'm not a proponent of implantable technologies apart from uh, devices that are uh, life-sustaining, like those that have to do with um, uh, defibrillators uh, or uh, heart pacemakers, or for example, insulin pumps, or last resort required for deep brain stimulation, uh, DBS devices, brain pacemakers for those who require them, suffering from Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. But we are witnessing here, when we are looking at these trends, we are witnessing from this big view, right down to the minuscule view, and that view it's, you know, for many providers, it's not just enough to know what you're doing on the handset. They want to have solutions for in-body, and that has massive social implications, but also ownership implications. Who owns the different kinds of data uh, characteristics? Who has the right, uh, if it's bi-directional flows, to communicate with your implantable devices or your wearable gateway that you wear on the outside? And so these are all questions that raise uh, a number of human rights issues, privacy issues, issues to do with consent. So let's move on here to quickly look at the operational scenarios. And here, there are three, in-body, on-body, or external. And then those three kinds of scenarios, when we relate them to one another, come out with about nine in a matrix. So my implantable, can it actually uh, communicate with the mobile phone, which is external? My implantable, could it communicate with a wristwatch? And what does that mean? So from in-body to on-body. And we depict this in the latest article uh, in Transactions on Technology and Society um, with the author team. And we look at this from the perspective of in-body devices within the human, uh, on-body devices that are human-centric, and on-body or in-body to the machine that's external. And I would call this a machine. I'd call a lamppost a machine. And if we were to look at these diagrammatically, imagine uh, my device is talking with other devices like external devices. Imagine uh, my implant is communicating with near field communication devices. Imagine my uh, implant is communicating uh, with uh, FPOS machines at the point of sale. Um, these are things that I could be wearing and they're communicating with external devices. And what if, for example, I have an implantable here on the left uh, that allows me to interact with the world around me, either to a kiosk directly, an RFID reader, or any other device that's external, like a lamppost. And so imagine this man is walking past, he has a wearable hub, he has implantables, and the lamppost is able to send the transaction of data. Hello, lamppost, perhaps, is what we'll be saying in the future, and the lamppost may be res responding, hello, Dr. Michael. And so this is a transaction, and we're already starting to see this with lampposts and everyday devices that we carry, although some of these things are happening covertly or with limited knowledge. For example, there are many shopping malls today that look at how their customers in the shopping mall frequent the surroundings using data analytics and location information to know where the customer is, where they stop and look at a shop window 
and a shop front for how long they, they stay there, what kinds of paths they may take when they go to the shopping mall. And so these devices are already communicating machine to machine, but some of these machines happen to be worn on the human body or in a belt buckle. And so these scenarios are becoming prolific. Here are all the things that I could do if I was gaming with an external device, I'm wearing a wearable unit and I'm playing with the Kinect. And this data is actually doing something here. You know, it's not only the movement of the mapping that occurs as I move around in front of the Kinect, but there's also other things happening there as well. It's capturing other data. It may be capturing my reflexes if it's a game of tennis that I'm playing with or a dance and how good I am and giving me statistics about this. Now, imagine we were doing this with an implantable device and all of these things that you see here about acceleration and position were actually the heart, were actually other parts of the body. And this is the information that may well be uh, transacted in the future. We can look at tethering to wearable devices from wearable to wearable. We could look at an implantable like this device uh, that was uh, a device that was implemented through a biohacker, Tim Cannon, uh, a few years ago. And he decided to tether his very big Cicardia device with a tablet. And all he was looking at was vital signs and statistics. So you could see the reams of data there in the blue screen showing with white records there. And that was recording heart rate, pulse rate, and one additional thing, uh, which was the temperature. Forgive me, just the pulse rate and the temperature on this occasion, I think through the Cicardia device. And then we have an implantable that you can see the top left screen. This is in the arm of uh, Mr. Emil Grafstra, interacting with an external device. So imagine I had an implant there between my thumb and forefinger, and I was using the device to actually uh, interact. And so that's the, I guess, uh, the in-body example there of an operational scenario. But as I said, increasingly, we are all carrying additional devices. Is this what the human body might look like in the future? Um, here was some work in speculation in 2005 uh, that I completed with Chu. Uh, and with him, he was a, a Singaporean a naval officer uh, doing his honours degree at the University of Wollongong. We hypothesised about hierarchical positioning. If somebody was in the Earth's surface, how could we know where they were? And the last smile was, in fact, an RFID potential to be implanted in the human body. Again, I'm not a proponent of this device, but I am being currently uh, seconded to considering uh, uh, small ventures uh, that are starting to begin uh, and to be talking at different kinds of uh, launches, for example, regarding implantable devices. Uh, the latest one from the UK with some startups uh, looking at border control. I see the human and social implications of this technology. I'd love to say that, yes, we could all put an implant device in and everything would be fantastic. You know, we'd be able to know when someone was going to get sick. We'd be able to know when someone had a fall down alert. We'd be able to know when someone was speeding and cut their speed in the car. Uh, we could know where people were that were in an emergency situation. We could know where COVID was. I mean, there are all these kinds of applications that have begun to be discussed. So ubervalence. I completed my PhD in 2003, but the concept of the electrophorus, the bearer of light, the bearer of electricity, came about around about 1997. And already in my thesis, I was talking about, have we really thought about the consequences of going from this tetheredness between the human and a machine to wearing a kind of implant device on the body to actually swallowing devices that were silicon based or had RFID transmitters. And lo and behold, we did hear in 2019 about devices that were RFID devices, basically so small that could be placed in a tablet that you swallowed for your illness and as a response to, you know, as medicine. And so these transmitters were so small uh, that they would dissolve in the human body, but they would be able to tell us about the behavior uh, of the individual and whether they were taking their medicine on time every day, and whether that was having an effect in the human body. Do look out for that research paper. In 2002, I published something in the Internet Commerce that looked at implantable devices and the experiment I had discussed with Professor Kevin Worry. In 2006, MG Michael 
defined the term uber valence in a class at the University of Wollongong. And it was really about situational awareness and predictive profiling and where the surveillance was all going. And it was all seeing, it was beyond the all seeing eye, it was within us. He was discussing embedded surveillance devices before they became a commonplace capability. So the who, the where, and the what condition, the physiology. In 2007, we published a, a volume, an edited volume, as part of the Secure uh, Research for Australia. And we looked at the concepts going from data valence to uber valence in the transparent society. We looked at concepts of what it would mean to hack the human heart or hack the human brain, and whether this access of access would lead to misinformation, the misinterpretation of data and information manipulation. And for all of you who are studying data analytics, from smart devices. This is one of the biggest shortcomings that we're seeing, not just in social media, but in actual products and devices, in consumer electronics even. Could the fallout of these technologies lead to misinforming or misinformation? Could it lead to a misinterpretation of data? What does the data really mean? Can I manipulate the data? And is that what's happening? As we've seen through political processes like campaigns and elections. And what about information manipulation? What does that mean? What if my data was denoting some kind of predictive element in your behavior, but in fact, you never carried out that behavior? And so we can see big discussions happening here uh, with many uh, big organizations like Palantir about what is happening with predictive data. 2007, Edge presented at the Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners Conference in Montreal, where he was asked to talk about uber valence. Uh, the late Robert Ella Smith, a privacy journalist and reporter, quickly took on board MG Michael's comments from that particular uh, privacy uh, conference and data protection conference and said, look, we have to look for this whole new technology that's about to come on board. And it's not just Big Brother, but it's Big Brother on the inside looking out. And what are we going to do? about the control and data ownership of the information that's emanating from everyday devices. At the same time, Forbes, uh, through Robert Ellis Smith, uh, made a big front page uh, sort of news flash on ubervalence. Uh, here we see a depiction of Jim Nuttall's drawing of ubervalence. And what he's showing here is still the big brother is still there. There is always still this notion of surveillance through data analytics. But in fact, we are now increasingly paranoid for those of us who are carrying implantables, and that's about 10% of Americans, according to the NIH, right? They're not all electronic implantables, but they are hip replacements, uh, knee replacements, and so forth. But we are becoming increasingly thinking we are playing to a global theater that our digital footprint is not just now what we buy and where we go via location, but it's also inside of us. It's how we're feeling. It's our levels of stress. It's our temperature, it's our sickness, it's our level of health. And this is a, a whole new era. In 2008, the term was entered into the Macquarie Dictionary and also made the New York Times on Schott's vocab. It was about total and inescapable internal personal surveillance. And here we can talk about the IEEE standard to the body area network, but also this notion of a, what's a personal area network. In 2008, and nine, our first uh, full length volume, 500 pages came out on innovative automatic identification and location based services from barcodes to chip implants. And what we found was there were increasingly a number of futuristic types of applications. In this instance, we have uh, Amor Grafstra's Vivo Key. The Vivo Key at the time uh, that it was launched somewhere around 2013 was looking at how we could place an implantable device in the webbing of our thumb and forefinger and use this as a means to enter absolutely anything and transact with the world around us using an encrypted device. And so uh, Mr. Grafstra was thinking about open ticketing, he was thinking about transit ticketing, bitcoins, you know, what if I, my handshake was actually a transaction at a bank? What if um, I carried information that could be unlocked through this uh, secure device in my hand? What if I could transact, I could purchase things, I could uh, uh, do communication with the government, for instance? The term then entered the Oxford Dictionary in 2010, particularly from a legal lens, 
and it was about ubiquitous or pervasive electronic surveillance that was not only always on, but it was always with you, right? This is transferable. I could leave it behind. I could put it in the boot of my car and let my car be with my husband while he's traveling, okay? But implantable devices, the difference between implants and mobile devices is that the implantable is always with you. I can't leave my heart behind, can I? I can't leave the defibrillator behind because that might mean I could have a cardiac arrest, okay? So we used to have devices like defibrillators that we would have to cart around with us that were actually in an external trolley device with a defibrillator on the device. It then moved from the trolley to around the neck. I used to wear it with me whenever I went, wherever I went in the 1950s. And finally, it did become implantable because that was the most convenient solution, right? It was protecting the device. It couldn't be tampered with, less chance of infection once something is fully embedded in the body. And so we are starting to see that the traction of this uh, seductive nature of embedded technologies is coming to the fore. In 2010, we also published this Proceedings of the IEEE paper on planetary scale RFID services in the age of ubervalence. I gave a talk on ubervalence in 2012. You can see that on TEDx. At that talk, I talked about how we're going from all of these different modes of operation. And of course, we're going to end up uh, with this scenario being offered to us of implantables. The question is whether society believes the hype around implantables. Uh, and for some of us, it's not hype, it's life sustaining, so we need it. But for others, is the convenience going to outstrip the control nature of microchipping people? And so I want to hover on this standard. You know, many of you might be thinking, what is Katina talking about? What do we talk about when we're saying the last mile, the black box within? We're actually talking about an IEEE standard here, the wide area standard for body area networks, right? Sorry, the, the wireless body area network standard. That's 802.15.6. And that came into fruition around about 2012. It is about real-time health monitoring. But as you can see there, it's also about consumer electronic applications. Whoa, right? IEEE have defined a standard that is also about implantable devices or wearables in the context of consumer technologies. It's an international standard for low power, short range, and extremely reliable wireless communications within the surrounding area of the human body, supporting a vast range of data rates for different applications. And keep in mind the data rates because it all has to do with spectrum. Okay? We can have all the standards we want, but these wireless devices work on spectrums. Okay, it's very important that I describe that. And so in 2013, we came out with the first book titled Ubervalence and the Social Implications of Microchip Implants. And that was the time that DARPA was releasing a whole host of uh, procurement uh, tender documents uh, saying, you know, for our ex-servicemen and women who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe we've got to start thinking about implantable devices. Uh, around about the time of the Iraq war, a bit earlier, we also had many servicemen and women coming back from war, uh, missing limbs as a result of landmines. And all of a sudden we were talking about the potential to have robotics uh, there with control from a computer just by thinking about it. So the human would have an implantable device placed in their brain that would be able to think about something, get into the zone, and actually then they could have a robotic limb opening and closing. Especially for quadriplegics, as we've seen, for example, at Brown's universities, we've seen somebody who could not use their limbs after becoming a quadriplegic. Think about requesting a robotic arm to come around and feed them and uh, provide uh, an ability to quench their thirst through the, the drinking of a water bottle. These are all real applications that we're starting to investigate. And we have some big companies backing the ability to have these implantable devices. So if you think you're not going to be uh, challenged by this notion of implantables in your lifetime, please think again. Companies like Medtronic, this was on the front cover of IEEE Spectrum, have wanted to implant sensors in everyone as a way to prevent perhaps uh, an attack, an acute attack of something like disease. Um, others have thought about it as a way to look at the uh, vital signs and characteristics over time of the human body and to perhaps use that to enhance somebody, whether it's through physical training or sporting regimes. 
uh, and still others have thought about this in the context of uh, when someone is having difficulty having a baby, for example, could temperature monitoring assist somebody not to have to go through uh, different kinds of options for uh, childbirth and they could simply monitor their own vital signs and characteristics to actually know when the best time was to attempt to have a baby. For example, there are many applications of this. But I do want to state this and underscore this. On the cover of IEEE Spectrum was something talking about an implant sensor in everyone and how would that change the landscape. Uh, NIST considers frequency bands here. You can see that in your own time. We're looking at different applications of this sort of wireless body area network for mix, medical instrumentation devices, for things like ultra wideband. And you can see the different megahertz and gigahertz scales here for different parts of the world. And so when we're looking at a global environment and we're talking about implantables and wireless devices, we simply can't assume that my device as I traverse the world around me is going to work the same way. In fact, we've seen incredible scenarios and here we're just looking at backscatter and propagation. If, if the, this place, NIST is speculating, is this where uh, the best place for a hub internal device might well be? Um, but we've also speculated on commercial devices that have nothing to do with medical. Elon Musk's Neuralink, for example, and what may that come forth with? Uh, I was giving a talk, a TEDx talk, another one uh, at ASU last, uh, earlier, earlier last year in May. And in this talk, I talked predominantly on brain implants and some of the social implications that this might bring in, especially for data analytics. Brain to brain interfaces, can you imagine that? And this year, uh, the case of an edited book by Isabel Peterson and her co editor, uh, Andrew Iliadis, for MIT Press, where MG Michael, Christine Paraxelis, and Robert Abbas and I uh, look at this notion of last mile surveillance. So if you want to see a close to 35 page uh, book chapter dedicated to what I'm talking about, it is this communal book chapter that's been edited with my peers where we talk about hypervalence in the context of implantables. And so, again, to stress here, with limited time to go, this is not just a one-way solution. This is bi-directional between devices. Where does the processing take place? Is it in the implant? Does it happen somewhere in the wireless sphere? Does it happen on a hub device? Does it happen back to base? And this notion of uh, tiny machine learning that's starting to uh, gain momentum. And where are the signals being extracted from and with whose permission? And so there are lots of social implications. Imagine the body was full of nanobots, these tiny micro nano computers that would be going around our body and looking at whether we would perhaps be predisposed to cancer. Is this what we're going to do in the future to the bloodstream? And if, if so, what does medical data analytics take us to? Will it be going away from the Internet of Things scenario to the Internet of us, our human body? There's an Internet within us. There's a body area network within us. And then, of course, issues to do with uh, electromagnetic interference, issues to do with biohackers wanting to take things into their own hand and saying, corporations, you might think you own, you own my insulin pump and my insulin data, but I've hacked the device, as has been demonstrated here, so that people have better visibility of how the internal implantables are working. Uh, future devices, what do we learn from pacemakers? Corrective firmware updates, they need to be updated. They suffer from, uh, you know, attacks, denial of service attacks or distributed denial of service attacks. Here we see an SQL injection, a paper written by Mark Gesson for IEEE East Has 10 uh, at the University of Wollongong, showing how malware could infect our, our data and also our implantables. And some of this is uh, perhaps, I would say, uh, deadly, right? Death by internet, perhaps. So to conclude briefly, the need to be part of the ongoing standards discussion is huge. We need to bring in sociologists, anthropologists, historians, theologians, psychologists, medical people, not just engineers to define a standard. I want to call on this community to basically say 802.15.6 is not complete if we don't get these discussions that are more robust. What does it mean to have an implantable device? What does it mean when we are traversing the world and don't know when something is triggering 
for example, in the RFID implant to emit signals to it in response, perhaps our unique ID. What happens when other devices are much more powerful and start to tether uh, to our, our implantables or wearables and start to do something? And what is the role of the data analyst here? Do they just ignore the privacy, security, ethics and human rights issues? Or do they become a part of this discussion and think about ways to encrypt the data and perhaps even offer it back to the patient or the citizen who's carrying the implantable device if they so choose to? What will last mile mean in the future? It used to mean to the house. It used to mean to the retail, perhaps shop front. What does last mile mean now? Does last mile mean to my Apple uh, wristwatch or does it mean internally to some brain implant like Neuralink in the future? Where does the computation happen? Is it going to be closer to the actual device on the body? Who may well uh, be dependent on a body area network? And what happens if we take this notion of black boxes and multiply them? I bring them together. So I have an implantable device that's a black box like the flight recorder, but it's in my brain. And then I layer that with AI and neural networks within the black box. I've almost got this multiplier effect that I just don't have a black box within. I just can't grab with my hands, take it out and put it somewhere and analyze it, right? I've got to have the know-how to get to it. But then I also have the algorithms that we're all building that actually may well not be in our control. What kind of data set will this be in terms of brain? And what does that mean? Does it follow that we now believe in the concept of death by internet? And what about social e-inclusion, equity, and exclusion? Which upgrade do you have? Which implant do you have? How does it work with the outside world? Can you go for a job interview at the same time I can? if there are all of these things happening. And I pertain to the last thing, which is perhaps the most important, bodily integrity laws that don't exist in the world. How do I maintain ownership of myself and of my data? We've already lost it through Google, through the searches that we perform. Now what's gonna happen when we're starting to look at Katina's heart rate, Katina's perhaps um, sensitive areas suffering from disease, Katina's uh, thoughts, which I don't think we're going to get to, but perhaps more precisely, Katina's state of her heart. Will I be insurable if the doctor or the insurance company knows what I'm swallowing and perhaps I'm not doing enough exercise, lending itself more to control? So with that, I hope you found the presentation entertaining. We've got about 10 minutes for questions and I'll hand back uh, to our panelists. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Katina Mankil. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for your nice presentation and valuable information given for all participants by expanding your valuable time for who would like to work on data analytics. I also would like to thank for all participants for utilizing this wonderful opportunity. Dear participants, you can post your questions in question answer. Otherwise, you can raise your hand. I will unmute them, unmute you, then you could ask. Dear participants, you can post your question in question answer chat box so that none of them answer to your questions. Or otherwise, raise your hand. I will unmute you, then you can ask. Uh, yeah, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, ma'am, uh, this, is, this is Surya, ma'am. Uh, I am the one of the organizers of this conference. Ma'am, there is a one question in, uh, in Q&A. Shall I, shall I read that, ma'am? Yes, sir, because I, I actually have flipped to a view that I can't see it. So please do. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'll read out. Uh, is there any uh, possibilities of uh, uh, spotting virus like COVID-19? Very good question. I think uh, we are already starting to see uh, projects like that between Stanford University and the Fitbit. Let's call them Google for now, although they're in the process of buying. And in this study at Stanford, what they have requested as a response to COVID is why don't we look at whether uh, wireless devices that we carry, like the Fitbit, that does take all those vital signs and characteristics, if I contribute all my data, whether in fact I can allow for the early intervention because I see in a society, if we all wore Fitbits, for example, we all wore the Fitbit device and we all gave our data to our governments or our medical health insurance companies, and they could see, ah, Katina and her son and her cousin and the work colleague 
they're starting to come down with something, some disease, let's call it COVID. Perhaps there is something going wrong. They've all visited the doctor in the last couple of weeks. So what we are seeing is this predictive element. The question is, with infections, we are told that about 80% only, uh, sorry, 80% of infections are mild or asymptomatic. That is, the person feels completely normal while they are carrying COVID. So if I am completely feeling healthy, but I'm a carrier of this ugly uh, uh, disease, this pandemic, and I'm going around my business, I don't realize I'm sick. My Fitbit is not really telling the, uh, the health insurer anything because I'm feeling fine, but I'm a carrier. And so this is where ubervalence comes into contact. Remember I talked about misinformation, information manipulation and misrepresentation. So the Fitbit thinks I'm fine, but in actual fact, I'm a carrier and I'm spreading disease to everyone around me, which is why the governments across the world have said self-isolate, quarantine, go into lockdown until we get this COVID-19 uh, under control. So I'm not saying predictive analytics is not good because as data scientists, right, all of you who are on the, at this conference are thinking about all the wonderful things you can do with big data, for instance. If we, if we just had the data, we could do X and Y. But we run the risk of the predictive analytics falling short. And let me show you this in the way we are looking at policing. For example, if my data set is being trained on black Americans or black British people, it may well have bias embedded in the actual algorithm in the black box. And so every time the camera sees this kind of activity, ah, it is a black ethnic minority that is the one who is the suspect. And yes, we've got the suspect. Okay, we put him behind bars or her. And so in the same way, we can say that if we were to use these tidbits or accountables that were constantly sending information back to our medical health insurers, quite possibly what we are saying is that we will find ourselves in the same mess. Either we will have panic for nothing, or we will not be actually panicking enough. We will not be responding enough to, to, to something. But I, I do sense that we are going to be using more and more technology to combat COVID-19. We are already seeing swarm intelligence through drones, and many of you will be working on the data analytics for these autonomous systems as they roam. Others will be looking at Fitbit and you know, the Stanford University kind of approach, which is give us your Fitbit data and we'll tell you whether you're, you're sick or not. In fact, is this a replacement for a COVID test? So currently there are not enough COVID test kits to go around. And so many universities are speculating, should we we'll be looking at AI and data analytics to tell us whether someone is a sufferer? But again, I go back to what if someone is asymptomatic, They're, they feel they look completely healthy, but they are the ones actually spreading the disease. So it's, it's very interesting, my friend. Um, the other thing is there's been a lot of conspiracy theory, of course, uh, over vaccines and whether they will be uh, re relayed out as uh, vaccines with implantable devices that show somebody uh, to be a carrier. I don't believe this uh, conspiracy theory. I don't think this is going to happen. Uh, until I hear otherwise, you know, I will let you know. But uh, a lot of people are speculating. Imagine you had this kind of capability where you could implant someone, have a vaccine, and then they, that could act as a digital hygiene certificate. So the carrier uh, who has had COVID in the past won't get it again or has been inoculated against it, but has taken a vaccine, they can roam the globe with this digital hygiene certificate. But it's a very interesting concept, uh, but one that I don't think the world is ready for at the moment. We just want to find the vaccine for now. So I liked your question, by the way, whoever asked it. It's an it's a invaluable question for right now. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Katina. This is Dr. Bhana Prakash. Uh, Hello, Dr. Uh, we, we do have uh, a lab related to microwave antennas and uh, uh, body area networks. So we would like you to help us for collaborative research with our department. So, like, even we expect, like, uh, please kindly accept our invitation for adjudicator, like thesis examiner. Like, in of fact, course. Surya Kiran, Surya Kiran uh, who is the host, is actually working on deep learning. There are some other scholars also working in deep learning and data analytics. So, I think uh, you can help us for a thesis examiner as well. And uh, one other thing is, I think I met your husband uh, from uh, University of Oloam. Yeah, a few, years a... Back in a, a few years back in an international conference. So he gave you a card, actually. 
Yeah. That's generous of yeah. him. So Dr. Banu, uh, he was very taken with all of you uh, and yeah. the hospitality you showed towards him. I thank you so much. Uh, as thank well, you. I remember he was telling me about the special uh, lunch he had with your team, but also the students. He came back boasting about how eager they were to learn and to listen and to act. I think you have a wonderful uh, establishment there at Kale University. And Dr. Banu, congratulations for for putting this event on uh, very well organized, my friend, and, and to better and bigger things in the future. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. We look forward for our collaborative research. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ma'am, ma there are two more questions. Can I ask? Of course, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, the second question is like, uh, does the posture of human body affect the MAC layer with respect to data transmission? Yes, it does. Uh, the water is made up of, uh, sorry, the body is made up predominantly of water, which is one reason we can't have GPS devices implanted in our bodies, right, for navigation. They have to be up, outside. So the water, the body acts as a, as a barrier to a lot of uh, interaction. But what we're finding increasingly is that uh, a lot of experiments are being done on where to place sensors in the body, how far away to place them. For example, brain pacemakers require the uh, bilateral implants the, 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 to go into the brain, but the actual battery pack is in the chest, here in the clavicles. And so there is a wire that travels up the neck into the brain. And that wire currently is not twisted pair and should be um, because it, it is lending itself to a lot of electromagnetic interference. But what a lot of people are starting to study is how can we get the battery smaller and how can we get it in the brain co-located with the implantable device? The same thing with the heart pacemaker. But when we are talking about hubs, where should the hub be? You know, I used to see a lot of different patterns. If you go to uspto.gov and you start searching on wearable hubs, implantable devices, uh, and spend many months looking at these patterns. I remember an early one saying it should be at the top of the head because the top of the head had line of sight to satellites or was not interrupted by any part anywhere else, right? So if we put it lower down in towards our tummy, there is a lot of backscatter and a lot of issue with propagation. Uh, it doesn't always work. And this we have seen with the COVID-19 uh, applications with Bluetooth low energy being used in the smartphones, actually not working to send an uh, anonymous identifier to another handset. So this has been a very interesting experiment with COVID-19, but in terms of where do you put it in the body? There are optimal places. Um, others had a, a pack here on the side of the arm. Uh, in the old days, they used to be fat packs. But this is the question, you know, what are we going to look like in the future? This is also an issue we should be thinking about as computational people. It's not just about the data or the smart devices, but are we going to change the way we look? Is it going to be smart glasses that we all carry as we're going around uh, looking at the world around us? On the one hand, the internet streaming transaction you know, and on the other, we can see the world. I don't know. I don't know. I hope we become and stay as natural as possible. And the last question there. Uh, the next question is like, uh, how to identify whether microchip is malfunctioning or not? Yeah, great question. I guess uh, we talk about this all the time. Uh, in some of the terms and conditions, for example, uh, in the Google Glass, if you are one of the first 1,800 people to sign up, about glass, right? The Google glasses that would uh, stream the internet and record around you if you wanted to. There was somewhere in the terms and conditions that the supplier had the right to switch off. This is the right to remove your capability of actually using the Google Glass, perhaps inappropriately. Uh, but I want to go to those terms and conditions because the user will be at the mercy of those terms and conditions in the future. So if the Corporation has the right to switch off. Perhaps I have the right to switch off your heart pacemaker. I have the right to switch off your diabetic pump. You know, what else are we going to have the right to do? Perhaps I use an access control matrix, and this goes back to MG Michael's definition of access of access, as in accessibility. So the access, AXIS, of accessing something, accessibility. Imagine I had the right to control you. I was your government. I was your medical health insurer. I was your bank. I was your telecommunications provider. And maybe I know the device is malfunctioning when I lose service completely. I don't have access. 
it's a loss of control. There's a denial of service attack. Oops, I can't access my Bitcoin or my blockchain. I don't exist on the blockchain for that 24 hours that I'm not a person because everything is centralized through this last mile implantable device. What happens, for example, when I'm locked out of funds, I'm locked out of a, my front door. You know, someone changes the locks. Uh, I'm locked out of my telephone for communications. Perhaps in the future, that's a brain-to-brain -brain message being sent to people. So we find out about malfunctions when there's a complete loss of service or when there's something going wrong, like a stranger has access to my front doorstep uh, if I have everything electrified in my home. It's a fantastic question. I know in the case of one deep brain stimulation recipient, Gary Olift, uh, from the former, uh, he was a former professor and actually a professor emeritus at the Colorado School of Mines, studying, studying remote sensing and, and electromagnetics. I know from him that it was instantaneous, right? So he has a deep brain stimulator. He went to a Best Buy store that sold electronics and immediately his DBS was tripped by the actual wireless environment he was working within. So he can't go to libraries. He can't actually uh, 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 not only frequent libraries, but also uh, go through uh, uh, shopping malls. He can't drive his car. His car has eight computers. Even Wi-Fi affects the DBS. So it's very interesting as for us to see when do you know it's malfunction, when it doesn't work, when you feel terrible, when you feel sick, or you don't have access. Uh, that's wonderful. Uh, we have questions from YouTube live also. Uh, we will do one thing. We will just consolidate all questions and uh, send across your mail. Okay. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time.